Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I think this, this is working fine. <clears throat> okay. What I'm going to take you through today is actually the story of a, a kind of a discovery that I made after um, struggling for some time. And then this discovery has some very broad implications for strategy, innovation, leadership, not just in a company context, but also in the context of our own individual you know, lives. Okay. So let me start by asking a question. If I was to ask you to come up with one word to explain the state of the world today, what would that be? Yes, okay. <laughs> Turbulent, very good. Change, right? So we're seeing this, and the fact is that, you know, this is the kind of thing that is a very turbulent world. And we used to say change is the only constant. But I beg to differ there, because change is not just constant today, change is dramatic. So the rate of change is dramatic. The amplitude of change is dramatic. And this change comes to us from all kinds of places, whether it is technology that's coming in, government regulations, or politics, or employees leaving companies, joining other companies, movement of employees, or competition. Okay? And then, of course, the customers in a globalized world with different preferences and different kinds of expectations. So when, when we're dealing with this kind of change, what do we need to have? This becomes the central question. Okay? And of course, it's not much of a, you know, much of, it doesn't take much brains to come up with this answer. That really speaking, what we need is nimbleness. Okay? That we need to be the ability to be agile, the ability to be nimble, to move, be flexible, to move between different kinds of things be adjusting to different kinds of environments. Okay? And very funnily, this nimbleness is required not just in organizations, but also in people. So in fact, one of the key essences here is that if you want to create a nimble organization, you need to have nimble leaders. Okay? And leadership is not just at the top level, but every person because of this turbulent environment even the front office person or the person answering the phone has to exert leadership in his or her own context. So here's one, Warren Bennis was a, a famous professor of leadership and he taught at the University of, South, uh, of Southern California, USC. And at the end of 50 years of remarkable research, this was the statement his, he made. The one confidence, competence that I now realize is absolutely essential is adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity or the ability to be nimble is absolutely critical for leaders. But take this other kind of statement, which is made by Lord John Brown, who used to be the CEO of BP, British Petroleum, and made it one of the world's largest companies. And he says, the only thing that you can give yourself the, cap the capacity is that give yourself is the capacity to respond to uncertainty. And the creation of that capability is the purpose of strategy. So you can see how nimble, being nimble, being agile uh, is flip sides of the same coin, from the person's side and from the company side. Okay? Now, before we do this, what happens here is that suddenly we have to we find that when we are engaged in this kind of turbulent world, we have to radically revise certain opinions certain kinds of mindsets that we had. And one critical thing is about strategy. Okay. Um, strategy here, as we know it, as many people assume it to be, is a plan of actions for the future. Right? This is the old strategy, where uh, if you were a hunter, okay, and you were shooting, you were out there to shoot a bird, and you see a bird flying out there, where would you shoot? You see the path that it's taking? Where it will be, right? So when, when you assume where it will be, actually you're making a projection and you're assuming 
that that bird is going to take the same trajectory as it had taken in the past. So that is the essence of strategy so far, that we believe that the road that, that is in front of us is very similar to the road that we've crossed in the last few you know, sessions. So the plan of actions to make a predictable future, this is the essence of strategy, that we make a plan of actions, but that plan of actions is determined by our assumption that what we're going to see in the future is predictable, that we can kind of create some kind of probability, assign some kind of probabilistic outcome to that. But really speaking, what we are looking at now is something called the swimmer. Okay? The new swimmer is basically saying he's swimming across the river and the currents are unpredictable and he wants to get to a certain spot on the other side where there's something, but that something keeps moving across on the bank. So what do you do? You don't jump into the water head down and swim straight to the spot where you saw it, but you repeatedly resurface and see where that point is and you keep moving toward that. So strategy is more a bunch of constant redirections, not a commitment to one particular path. So what happens here is that we actually now start to think about what do I need to do? What capabilities would, do I need? either in me or in my organization, that will keep us nimble to perhaps meet an unpredictable you know, future. So the future is there. We have some understanding of what we need to do. And we start moving toward that. Future moves, we must be able to move. So this is, you know, this is what we would call micro strategy, a lot of small steps to reach the final goal, not one big mega strategy. So this is a big transition that we have to make in organizations. And this is also true in our own personal lives. Okay. Now, this, given this challenge, this is where my story begins. Okay. Um, Harry traced some of my beginnings. But basically, I was a tech slash quant jock before I embarked on this thing. Okay. I got my bachelor's in electrical engineering, um, then went on to do a graduate uh, program in uh, computer science. And I came to the US to study at Dartmouth to do a PhD in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And this was back in the late 80s, when AI was uh, still emerging out of its cocoon. But when I got there, I realized that although I was working in computer vision, we were not moving much beyond pattern recognition. Okay. And AI seemed kind of stuck at that time. It has resurfaced only in the last couple of years but it was stuck for a long time there. And so I moved over to distributed computing and got a master's in this. And uh, distributed computing, of course, as you know, is the precursor to today's uh, cloud computing. And then I went to work on Wall Street. Okay, and so when I went to work on Wall Street, Wall Street was transitioning from mainframes to you know, distributed computers, and I helped them think through this. And I had a PhD in economics and of IT at Wharton, basically came back to study you know, how do, how do we invest in information systems? What kind of economic decisions can we make? And then I started as a professor. So my, my, my first job as a professor was in the business school at Purdue. And uh, when I started there, that was when hell was breaking loose, right? The e-commerce revolution was going on, late uh, 90s. And there was a huge boom and there was a bust, right? If you all remember that the, the e-commerce bubble burst and Things were so unpredictable because all kinds of new things were being uh, were emerging. So in this context, my search started to be, you know, what what does how does one make strategy when the world is so turbulent? And this led me to again go back, fall back on my strengths, which was all about analytical and uh, mathematical modeling and microeconomic modeling. And so I was juggling with this, setting up game theoretic models and all that stuff, but. Nothing deemed, seemed to be giving me a good insight. And this was when, in 1998, actually, 20 years ago, I got a remarkable insight. I went to ISIS, not the ISIS that you're thinking of. Uh, it's the International Conference of Information Systems. Okay. So, and of all, this was in December 1998, and of all places, this conference was being held in Helsinki, Finland in December, cold December, <laughs> Helsinki, Finland. So my wife wanted to come with me, so you know, kicking and screaming, I dragged her uh, to, to Helsinki. And we landed there, 
luckily for me, because I was going from Minnesota, it was not so much of a transition, I felt. Um, but when we got there, that was when the whole story began to unravel. I was going to make a presentation the next day in a workshop called WorkWise, Workshop on Information Systems and Economics, and I had forgotten to bring the adapter for my laptop. I had forgotten not to bring the adapter, but the plug, you know, the, and I found that this, this thing, the European, the Helsinki plugs were very different. The plug point was very different. And so here I was in cold Helsinki on the streets of the day that I land in the evening looking for an adapter for that plug so I can use it for my power laptop. And the Finns didn't know English, and I didn't know Finnish, right? And that evening, going through the streets of Helsinki, asking for you know, directions, trying to articulate what I wanted. And then somebody said, Stockman. So Stockman, what is Stockman? Is it a place? Is it a, you know, some kind of an area? Nobody knew, it seemed to know. But ultimately, I started plodding through, plodding through, asking people, and ultimately came up on Stockman, which was a departmental store. And here, of course, I found my adapter. But that evening, in the hotel room, I started dwelling on this, what had happened that, that evening. In this period, in an area, in a, in a city which I knew nothing about, lack of knowledge, I, I didn't know the language, I didn't know directions, but I had come up with a problem and I had been able to solve it. So how was I able to solve it? all goes back to a very, very fundamental thing that we humans all have in common. Okay. If you think about it, you know, take the North American continent, 10,000, 11,000 years ago, there were no humans on this continent. But the first humans came across the Bering Strait from Russia <coughs> into Alaska, a small stretch of sea. Paleontologists believe that maybe it was frozen and there was a land bridge, maybe it was shallow, whatever. But the first humans came over. And because 10,000, 11,000 years is not such a big you know, uh, period in human history, they were more or less like you and me. Right? So we're not talking of Neanderthal man, etc. So these guys came. And when they came into this harsh country, there was no food except big game the giant bisons, the woolly mammoths. You know, there's this very uh, lovingly portrayed in Ice Age, in the, the cartoon movies Ice Age. But really speaking, these were, you know, huge animals. And there was no other food. And how could somebody like you and me with no weapons, no guns, be able to survive here? But they did. So 10,000, fast forward 10,000 years, there are no woolly mammoths, there are no saber-toothed tigers. There are no, you know, giant sloths, but there are humans. And what gives? It's this one characteristic that we all share to together. That's human intelligence. That intelligence, so now suddenly I started saying, it is not microeconomic analysis. It's not mathematical modeling that will give me the answer. I need to think back to see is there a, if there is an equivalent for human intelligence in organizations. Is there something that we can call an organizational intelligence? Okay. And because when you look at it, what human intelligence has done throughout the ages has, it has made us adaptable. It has helped us explore new places, new things. It has helped us evaluate and take risk. And most importantly, when we don't know, when there is a lack of knowledge, we have been able to succeed primarily because of relying on intelligence which tells us, oh, well, this knowledge is obsolete and not applicable in this particular context. You should use some other piece of knowledge. So it has been selective in helping us choose the appropriate knowledge to deal with this particular uh, set of circumstances. So when I went back here, organizational intelligence, again, you know, for me being a, a quant jock, when we think about intelligence, the thing that jumps up to mind is what? How do we measure intelligence? IQ, right? So we all say IQ. So I said, if I can find something that's equivalent to intelligence in organization and call it organizational intelligence, and if I say 
this company has more organizational IQ than this company, then automatically I will be able to say that this company is more you know, flexible, more agile than this company. But there was a tremendous amount of learning that I had to undergo here before that. So here, to give you a context of why this is so important for us to think about intelligence, here's how the psychologists de define intelligence today. It's the ability to do one of these three things. Adapt to an environment, to reshape an environment, or choose a new environment. And it also is a meta capability to say, which of these should I do now? Okay. So to give you a very practical, everyday circumstance, I walk into this room and I find it's very hot. So I adapt to the environment by taking off my jacket. Or I reshape the environment by turning on the air conditioning. Okay. Or the third one, as I say, this room is too stuffy, let's go somewhere else. Right? I can do any of these three. And it depends on the circumstances, which one of these I will choose. Now this has very interesting parallels to what has been going on in business world about competitive strategy. Okay. The first one is very much like what you call competitive forces, the famous Michael Porter and Harvard who invented the five forces, who said that there are five different forces that affect a company's strategic positioning. And these are you know, you know, power of the customer, power of the supplier, et cetera. There are five different forces, and the company, company must be able to predict and build a strategy to deal with these forces. So that's the competitive forces. So exactly the adaptation. There are things going on in the out, outside environment. How do I adapt to that? Reshaping the environment, core competences, right? Where you say, oh, we, this is our essential strength. How do we use that to leverage and create a competitive advantage for ourselves, or technology, or people, or knowledge. You know, so these are things that you would use to reshape the environment. And fourth one, the third one is, of course, the blue ocean strategy. How many here have heard of the blue ocean strategy? Right? The blue ocean strategy is basically saying, forget about competing with others. Always find new places where there is no competition. If you are a winemaker, try and build a whole new market of, of wine buyers. Don't try to compete for the guys who are making wine right now. So uh, compete with the guys who are making wine, wine right now. So this is the thing. So very interesting parallels to how strategy happens. So this was very, very attractive to me. This coupled with the fact that I could actually do something with IQ uh, was very attractive to me. But here was where I was really dumbfounded. So to take you through that, I'm going to ask you a question and give you about 30 seconds to respond. And the question asks for how you would solve a problem, not the exact answer. And the question is this. How would you find the distance from your home to your favorite new movie theater? Google, OK. Anything else? Sorry? Odometer, right, right there, exactly. Anything else? Ask someone. Ask someone, absolutely. Again, that's also <laughs> odometer versus the steps. It's the same category. Anything else? Time, Sorry? Time, how long it takes? OK, time. So again, an analysis of a formula application. A fourth one is there, which is, you know, I don't know the distance to the theater, but I know the distance to the market, which is on the other side. And it's approximately the same. So I take that and say, this must be the distance to the theater. So transposition of a solution from one domain to another. Okay. Now, very interestingly, these lead, so these are, so use formulas or Google Maps, drive there and see the odometer, walk there and count your steps, uh, find an equivalent place and use that distance, and finally ask somebody. So there is not one way intelligence is used to solve the same problem. Right? So this blue my mind now. So suddenly I'm talking about IQ and what happened in, when I started looking at the literature on IQ was I found that I was 25 years behind the curve because researchers at Harvard and Yale and, and everywhere else had left IQ as a, you know, as an obsolete concept because they found that if you were to take a basketball player on the court 
and give him an IQ test, he may perhaps score not very high on it, but he's demonstrating tremendous intelligence on the court. How do you categorize that? How do you categorize a musician who's tremendous who dem demonstrates tremendous intelligence and in picking up a tune and playing it and may not score high on an IQ test? So they realized that what IQ tests were doing were was measuring only a part of that some facets of intelligence. So what were those facets? So Harvard came up with seven, perhaps eight different kinds of intelligence. At Yale, somebody else was working with three. And I, when I looked at all this stuff and started to push it toward an organizational context, found that there are five different kinds of intelligence. Yeah. And these basically create the five kinds of agilities. They drive the five agilities. So here's the first one, the analytical agility which you use when you actually have solved the problem, you don't need, or somebody has solved the problem, you don't solve it, you just pull it out of a, a database. Google Maps, those of you who said Google Maps, what you're demonstrating is analytical agility. Okay? Somebody who says, I'll jump into the car and drive, they're saying operational agility. Okay? Somebody who says, I'm going to take that solution from here and apply it there, that's inventive <laughs> agility. Communicative agility is when you say, the guy next to me knows the answer, so why should I go searching for it? I just ask him, right? So that's communicative agility. And finally, there's visionary agility, right? The visionary agility is when you think about the long term. So for a long time, actually, I just had these four, because when I answered the question, uh, the distance to your favorite movie theater, there were four responses there. There wasn't a fifth, right, if you remember. So what gives here? So for, for a long time, I had these four, and I was going around you know, talking to various companies, uh, saying that this is a, you, know, you need to have these four agilities to balance these four agilities, see what's appropriate for you, et cetera. And suddenly, one of the prime examples I had for, these, for this framework collapsed overnight. And that was a company that had been for six years called the number one innovator in the whole world, six years in a row, and then overnight it collapses. Anybody know what that is? Nokia. No? <laughs> Enron. Thank God we've forgotten it. No. Okay. Enron. Enron was called between 2001 and six, I think, for six years in a row, and it was named the number one innovative company in the world. They're financial wizards. You give them anything, they could package it into something that could be sold on a futures market or an options market, wherever, right? But then ultimately when things were peeled off, we found that there was a lot of hollowness in that company. So what is the problem then? Immediately it strikes you that it's an ethical issue. And in fact, I was tempted to call it ethical agility, ethical intelligence. But really speaking, what I realized was that it's not just ethical, it's the inability to think beyond the current um, think beyond the now. That's, that's, that's what limits it. So visionary agility, I call it the visionary agility, the ability to see far, but also the ab ability to see wide. So I'm making this impact, this decision, but where is the impact? How wide is it, the impact? Are other people, who, who are the other people getting imp uh, impacted by this decision? How does it affect them? So when you broaden your scope and deepen your scope, then what happens is that you start to think about problems in a very different way. So these five agilities together constitute what I call the five agilities. I want to tell you an interesting story here to differentiate between ability and agility. So I'm good at math. That doesn't make me analytically agile. It makes me analytically able, right? What's the difference here? So here's an interesting story with McKinsey. Um, what happened was in, you remember that AT&T was a big monolithic corporation. You know, it was a, getting to be a monopoly some years ago. Um, and this was 1984 actually. And uh, it was ordered to break up into baby bells. So it broke up into all these small regional bell companies. But then the question was, we have a lot of land, we have a lot of mobile lines. What do we do with this? cellular capacity, okay? So do we distribute them or do we sell them off? Do we keep them? Maintaining them is going to be a cost, et cetera. So they hired McKinsey. And McKinsey came in um, 
and said, well, if you look at the trajectory right now of how technology is progressing, it's 84, 15 years from now, there will be only 900,000 users of cell phones yeah, in 1999. And so you should not um, keep these mobile lines. So AT&T sold them off. And what happened? By the time actual fact was that in 1999, there were 900,000 users every three days, right? But then luckily for AT&T, they recognized this problem uh, about five, six years before. So mid 90s, they're scrambling to say what to do. And they bought, they had to go back and buy, you know, their landline from Macaw Cellular. They paid $5 billion to get their um, their own cellular lines back. So this, now uh, we all know that McKinsey is tremendously um, analytically good, right? That they're very, very good analytic um, people. But what went wrong? So this was what went wrong. This was their projection. See that dotted line that you can barely make out above the x-axis? And that's the actual line, the sales. So what made this huge difference? The McKinsey projection versus the actual. What McKinsey did was when it started analyzing that uh, mobile line capacity, mobile line potential, they used the same model as you would use for detergent or soap bars, right, or vacuum cleaners, which was a 1 or 2 percent growth year on year. Right? And so with that, they come up with that thing. But really speaking, they forgot that mobile lines are actually, uh, they actually come under the effect of something called network effects. That if you're the only person in the, in the world who has a phone, that system has no use for you, right? Two people, it multiplies. Three people, it squares. So it goes on. It's actually explosive, right? It's exponential. So that's how it grows like this. The, the, um, the mobile phones go like that. And if, in fact, they had to just choose the right model. If they had gone back to, this was the projection, if they had gone back to when AT&T introduced landlines between 1900 and 10, you can see the similarity between the curves, right? So it is not that McKinsey was not analytically, analytically capable. They were not analytically agile. They didn't choose the right um, model to use here. So this is the difference between agility and ability. Okay? That just because somebody is great at math doesn't mean that if they're given a different kind of problem, they will be able to solve it. They must also be agile. Yeah. Are some problems inherently difficult? Absolutely. There are some. But then the problem is, have you chosen the right models? Have you made the right assumptions? This was a very clear. The data was available here from, their, from at and own lines. Also, given that this was a phone system, you could have gone back to the phone systems that and seen the studied the phone systems rather than vacuum cleaners and detergents, right? So the model, the cho choice of the model, um, choice of the data set to analyze was wrong here. So they're not agile. They're, they're doing con constantly doing product um, growths using what you would call consumer products. So they build it as a consumer product rather than as a networked product. That was the, the key here. So what does this take us to? So this is where you know we can locate each, us, each of our, uh, us, ourselves, or a company. And I'll talk in the context of companies here. So this is, this is what we call the agility matrix. And there are two things that come up here. One is, are you agile or not? And are you context sensitive or not? As I said, you must be able to use these agilities in appropriate context. right? So you can think of those five agilities that I've been talking about as colors, as primary colors, right? If I want to get a particular color to paint, what I need to do is mix three primary colors to get that particular color, right? Same way, if I need to solve a problem, I can mix four different agilities to come to that thing, but I've also realized that in all cases, you need the visionary agility. So the visionary agility can be thought of as the medium with which you mix those colors. If you're painting with watercolors, you'll use water. So if you're painting with um, the five agilities, you'll use visionary agility as the medium. Now, which of these should I use in what context? That is what tells me the context, it gives me the context sensitivity. 
There are companies which are dinosaurs, huge you know, companies with lots of resources, but unable to adapt. And we saw this a lot in the mini computer industry um, some years ago, in the 90s, where there were powerhouses. So for instance, uh, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, was the second largest company uh, in IT after IBM. And within three years, it collapsed. Why? Because they did not adapt to the new Sun workstations and all the digital workstations that were coming up. So these are dinosaurs. They die when circumstances change. Uh, bears are also not agile. They're not agile. But what happens is that they know that they're, they cannot operate in this context. So they withdraw and then come back when the context is right. And you can think of these as being seasonal companies. So companies that work um, when the season is good and go back when the season is not so great. Cheetahs, now the cheetah is a very strange animal. How many of you know that the cheetah can't hunt in the night? It cannot see in the night. Its vision is very much like ours. It has no retractable claws, so it can't climb trees. It's the most powerful running machine God has ever invented. right? But it can only hunt on the plains of savanna, right? The, the, the whole South African plains, it can only hunt there. It cannot run in any kind of, so it has to have that long stretch of flat land to be able to hunt. So its agility is singular, only running capacity. So you can call it operational agility. So Cheetah is a very singular agility. So many companies are like this. We came up with Nokia some time ago. Nokia is a single agility company because it was tremendous in its supply chain management, but not much else. It could uh, do a lot of you know, supply chain jugglery, but it couldn't manage you know, even strategic decisions like changing to a different operating system. So the model here, because of the whole intelligence parameter for us as humans, because we're not only able to be fast in our thinking, but also strategic or wise in our thinking. So this is why we say that the model that we need to have is a human model. But two things emerge here, that we need to be able to use the five agility, agilities and apply them in accordance to the context. This context may require us to persuade. This context may require us to act. So which, when, when to do what is also an important thing. Okay. So I want to give you a, a story of a company um, that started off, uh, that, that absolutely illustrates these five agilities in, in um, in actually a very, very changing marketplace. And this is the retail space, which has been going through a tremendous amount of transformation. And this company is Zara. Okay. The, how many people have bought clothes from Zara? Okay. Fantastic. So you know that one of the key things in Zara shops is that if you don't go and buy, if you don't buy it right then, next time you go in, you may not get it. Okay. Right, so this is a, a fast fashion model, and they made that a kind of a key for you to buy things to, to be successful. So here's what a story from 2015. Yeah. Four stores in Tokyo, Toronto, San Francisco, and Frankfurt reported to the headquarters that people had come looking for pink scarves, and the store didn't have it. Within seven days, 500,000 pink scarves were being sold in the more than 2,000 you know, Zara stores. And they were sold out in three days. Okay. So this is tremendous supply chain agility, right? That you, you run, but it's not just supply chain agility, so I'm going to show you the stuff. Okay. Um, Zara's business model is very, very simple. Okay. It has customer at the center. There's design, manufacturing, logistics, and stores. 96 countries that it operates in, it has nearly 2,300 stores now. And this is rapidly expanding. In fact, it is the oasis in the desert of retail fashion today. Because most retail companies are reporting negative profits, and Zara is the only one that has been able to stay above and, and be posit, uh, profit positive. Okay. So here's how the agilities work in Zara. And, uh, the day begins with what are called store management assessments, where the store manager gathers all the people who are working in the store 
and ask for feedback. What sold yesterday? What did not sell? Did people come looking for something that we did not have? Did we sell something um, that was, uh, did, do we have something that's not selling? So all this is collected and this is fed to, so that is communicative. So you can see that the data gathering is actually personal. And not just at the store management, um, in fact, customers who come in and ask for a pink scarf and didn't find it are asked, <coughs> are asked further questions by the customer service representative. Why do you want a pink scarf? What pattern would you like, et cetera? So this is gathered, and the store manager accumulates all that in the morning, and every day that data is sent across to the corporate headquarters in Spain. And that's where the analysis begins. So now from this, patterns are detected. So there's four pink scarves, stores having pink scarves. It's not just those four stores. There's actually a pattern emerging there that says that they should be making more pink scarves. And that data is used by three teams, commercial design and production teams, which sit together and make a determination as to which design should be made. Because there's profit considerations, there's cost considerations, um, there's design considerations, how much time would it take to make that? So all the commercial team gets into that, the design team gets into that, and then the production team. And there are 300 in-house designers who are divided across three different segments, men, women, and children. Okay? Now there's a lot of redundancy here, 40% excess capacity. This goes against totally against the grain if you're considering lean manufacturing and lean kind of technologies, right? You're actually building 40% excess capacity. But that's where they get their strength from. So when the pink scarves come in, the demand for pink scarves comes in, this 40% excess capacity is able to pitch in. And not only that, they're able to be flexible between these two. So they're not very rigidly apportioned uh, to men, women, and children. If there's a singular demand for women's stuff, people from men and children design move over. So there's a lot of flexibility in the design group. Okay? So that's where the inventive agility comes in. Okay? Then this is a key, of course, is the operation, getting it out across. Stores place orders two times a week, and they've determined when that should be, the most optimal time that, that should happen. It's before and after each weekend. And the stores are supplied two times a week. Small batch sizes, this goes against the grain in retail industry. So you don't have 200, 300, 500,000 piece orders. You have only 80 to 80,000 orders. And it takes three weeks from design concept to, to them being available in the store. Okay? Most production, because I want to keep a control on how this quality or with the, the design, faithfulness to the design, most production is made in Spain close to the corporate headquarters where the design has happened. And there are now opening factories in Bangladesh, Morocco, and Turkey, and China also. Spain has 313 stores, and the next country is 193 stores in China. Okay. Not only that, they're moving into e-commerce. And where they're, and they have a very interesting strategy there. They're not just Zara.com, but they're collaborating with places like Amazon, uh, with, uh, in India, Flipkart, where they actually have a partnership with these uh, marketplaces to sell their goods. Okay, so this is tremendous operational agility. Okay? Now in all this, what we've covered is analytical, operational, inventive, and to some extent communicative. But really speaking, where is visionary? Right? So this is what makes things strategic. This is the strategic bet that they take. They realize that it's not the customers, but the workers in their companies that are their real strategic assets. So they focus on doing a lot for their workers, right from uh, arguing with, the, you know, dealing with their human rights to, you know, traceability, you know, various kinds of things like investing in the well-being of their workers, uh, providing health and safety, women's empowerment, uh, even protection of immigrants and migrants, providing leave, living wages. So all this is very, very employee-centric. So this is where they, they make their strategic belt. So this is how they've actually been able to do tremendously well. So if you look at CAP, it's this dark blue line, low at the bottom, and Inditex, which is the parent company of Zara, is right there. The next one there in between is H&M, which is again a Spanish company, and is trying very hard to replicate Inditex, but it's not able to do that. 
Um, and, but then the good news is that if you can imitate Zara's model, you can actually be like Zara. So if you look at this from 2007 to 18, you look at uh, coal, which is right here, uh, the purple. So it's now started to imitate Zara and it's catching up and it's doing quite well in that thing. So, so, so also Gap, they're trying to do catch up with, with imitate Zara's model and they're doing quite well. So the, the good news is that these models can actually be replicated in various organizations. So okay, comes back to my favorite, you know, thing about measuring. Okay, all this is stuff, uh, all this stuff is great, but can we actually measure a thing? So what I did was I worked with researchers at Yale and Cornell, and primarily we developed based of their psychology uh, metrics, combining that with organizational metrics, we come up with a test, an assessment, and we can actually measure you know, agility at the individual level or the team level in terms of people, and at the organizational level in terms of processes and technologies uh, in the company. So that leads to both leadership agility and organizational agility. And we also bring in culture when we talk about organizational agility. So uh, some organizations may have a more communicative culture which allows it, you know, there to be much more easy dissemination of information and decentralization of decision making. But in some other organizations, that might be difficult. And they might have to focus on that. So here's an interesting example. Here's a research scientist uh, who's working in a pharmaceutical company. And what we discover there is that the inside line is what his agilities are. Okay. And you will see that on analytical and inventive, the two critical things needed for a research scientist is pretty good. And visionary is not doing too bad, but he's not doing too well on the operational and the communicative, right? Because he's in a lab. He doesn't need to talk to anybody. He doesn't need to be uh, involved with other people. He's not too worried about the operational stuff. He's very inventive. He's kind of worried about the creative stuff, but not so much about making it operational. So this is great if he wants to continue being a research scientist. But if he wants to move up to VP, R&D, or senior level executives, then he'll have to improve the operation because now he'll have to start saying, okay, these are great ideas, but how do we actually make the, take them into production? So he will have to collaborate with those. He will have to be much more communicative because he will have to fight for budgets with other you know, operational heads. So um, how, do we, how does he transition? So and the, the, again, as I said, the good news is that intelligences are like muscles. They can be trained. So the agilities can be developed if you start solving certain kinds of problems um, and, be, and simulations. Okay. This is from an organizational agility. Now in organizations, what we do is we take a different tack here. We get a bunch of executives to sit down and say, what is the market needing? What does the industry need right now? Um, so here's the, the red is where the, um, the, the blue is where the agility's map is. That is, that's what the industry needs. So in this case, they say they need to be much more inventive. Uh, they need to be not so analytical, not so communicative, and even less operational. But need of the hour is inventive and visionary, the strategic components. And then they measure themselves. And then they say, well, this is where we are. And so now we find the gaps. And our consultations are primarily taking them to address these gaps. Oh, you're here, and you need to get to there. How do we build the stuff? Okay, what, what can we do? What processes need to be changed? What um, new methods need to be brought in here? Okay. So what agilities does the business environment need is what the mapping does. What agilities does the business unit have is the assessment stuff. So how to get to agilities required by mapping the agilities that, that the business unit right, right now has. This is the uh, thing that we do. And I'll give you a very quick uh, case study here. Um, this was a company that we were called into because this company was having a lot of issues with conflict in the organization. Okay. And uh, we're really a strategic company, but we went in and we did, we administered the assessment, and we found that Typically, you see there are two kinds of measures that come out of our assessment. One is, 
one is what we call the lifestyle. So when I asked you the question, you immediately responded with one particular way of measuring the distance from your home to the theater. That's a style. Okay? It comes naturally to you, primarily because you're conditioned that way or you, you've been trained that way. The other is the ability. Maybe you don't have the ability. Maybe you're a writer in an engineer skin, right? So uh, you might have, writing might be your most capable thing. So what the blue thing does is the uh, lifestyle. And so this is the lifestyle and that this side is the inventory. So with that we call the inventory. What problems can you really solve? Okay. So two kinds of mismatches come up. One is a mismatch between the red here, which is the ideal, and the blue, which is the style. And the other is a mismatch between the two blues. Okay. So in this case, if you look at it, very interesting things happen. If between the two, um, you will see that the major difference is in communication and inventive. The communicative agility and the inventive agility. So what happens there is we then started looking at this. And we dealt, dwelt into the history of the company and found that this company had rapidly expanded. It's a 300, 400 person company in, uh, in India now, a software company. It had rapidly expanded from 20 to 300 in a matter of two years. But most of these guys were not really equipped to deal with international customers. And so they had major communicative issues. And when they went, the project heads went and started negotiating with international customers. They got beaten down in the negotiations, came back with very hard deadlines, very low costs. And so the teams had to bear the burden. And in this process, they actually had a lot of uh, you know, strife. Second, if you look at the inventive, what we find is that they have much more inventive intelligence that's not being used. The workplace is actually very, very routine. So one of the things that we suggested was that they introduce a kind of a policy where you make some kind of time, like Google does, for individual inventive projects. Okay. So can they create some kind of create, give some time off for creativity? So this is the uh, policy kind of thing. And for the communication, we suggested that they organize some communication workshops. It was more of a learning intervention there uh, to help them improve their communicative skills and negotiation capabilities. Okay. So this is the kind of thing that happens. So in summing up, what we have come to understand here is that agility is not one, but not singular. So it's agilities, and there are five different agilities, analytical, operational, inventive, communicative, and visionary. And these agilities are context sensitive. In different contexts, you might need to use different, con uh, different agilities. And innovation is not always good. There are two very interesting cases I have in the book. One is Lego, which, was, uh, which had never seen a profit decline until 60 years into its um, existence. In 1993, for the first time, it saw profit decline. And why? Too much innovation. So just thinking about innovation, so they became lopsided on the innovative uh, aspect too many pieces to handle in the supply chain, too many pieces to negotiate with uh, across designs. So more innovation is not always good. And I have another case also in the book called Avery, the business labels manufacturer. Too many ideas being put into production and as a result not being able to manage the production itself. Okay. So the five agility strategy primarily asks you to think about you know, mapping, what agilities do I need to solve this particular problem, assess, what agilities do I have to solve this problem? Strategize, okay, now I don't have this or I have this. How do I leverage what I have? How do I make up for what I don't have? And then don't jump in and, and make one commitment, but take small steps, like walking on ice. Make small steps, don't take giant strides. Okay? So this is the ultimate thing. So this is what I've written the book about. And, um, it's interesting, been very interesting uh, to, to do this. Yeah. So I'm open to questions. We have some time for questions. Yes. How are you determining your ideal benchmark for the weights of the, the five categories? OK, so uh, what we do there is the assessment says that we give you 100 questions. Okay? And they're all equally divided across the five different agilities. Okay? 
the so you should ideally be solving each one with the same kind of thing. So if you have 20 questions on each, you must be able to solve those 20 questions, answer those 20 questions with that agility. But what happens is people solve this kind of problem that needs operational agility, for instance, with analytical agility. So that's where the, so the ideal is, that's why it's a balanced thing, that there are five different things, all of them, the, the problems are the same uh, number. So if you've solved 20 of these, you've solved 20 of those, everything, you get five, but you get imbalanced because of this. But you had the one slide where you had different weights for the ideal. Ah, that was, okay. Oh, that was, uh, that was, so that, that is in the company context. So in a company context, what happens is a set of executives will sit down and say, what is our assessment of the scenario? So the different weights that you see there are, what is the assessment of the scenario? In this scenario, this, in the thing that we showed, they wanted to be much more inventive and visionary. Uh, and then they said, okay, we don't have that much. So how do we actually build that into the company? Yeah. So kind of jumping on, on what he was talking about, you know, you the ideal... Can you ideal, speak through that? The ideal balance is different depending on the situation for each company. Correct. Um, and if, if executives sit and then determine what they think the ideal balance is, that's working on the assumption that they know that. <laughs> and in, in a very fast moving environment, most of the time they don't. True. So how do you, and, and so, I mean, so how do you, um, and, and also in a fast moving environment, it turns out, you know, usually there's one like unique thing that, that pops up and it's not always the obvious one. Mm -hmm. So if you if you just have executives sitting and uh, because they're also working from the past, yeah. right? So they are pro, they are they have preconceived notions based on their past, sure. and if they determine what this ideal balance is, and how do you how do you um, how do you yeah. uh, be more objective with that? So what we try to do is that's why this is more of a three hundred and sixty in some sense that we get multiple managers from different parts of the company to, to participate in this. So this, when we come up with that final thing, it's not just one manager's perception, but it's a group's perception. So that's, so this is the limitation of strategy, right? We can never have full knowledge of what's going to be uh, possible. So we move that from being an action uh, to becoming, or oh, we need to have capabilities here. Right? So when you say those uh, five different uh, agilities, what we're doing is building capabilities to address those agilities. So um, oh, we need to be much more innovative in our company. So how do we build the innovative capacity capability in a company? So that's where we go. So we have some lever here, uh, unlike the original strategic, strategic thinking, where we have very set goals and we're going toward that goal. Here we have a capability, so we, have, we can afford to be a little lax in terms of developing or over-developing the, the capability. So, so a question is, the talk as of now covered what the framework is, mm -hmm. how do you evaluate for a company as well as individually, mm -hmm. but, but can you a little bit stress on, let's take, if I individual, lacks in innovation or a company yeah. lacks in uh, analytical thing. So how do you, how do you uh, suggest improving it or okay. what, what's the direction after that? Yeah. In fact, in the book, I have a small set of exercises at the end. So as I said, these are agilities or intelligences are like muscles, right? They can be trained. You go to the gym and you develop that work on that particular muscle, you can actually develop that. Same thing, you simulate problems. Um, which require analytical agility, then you actually get to um, develop that. So what we do in the sessions, you know, we go in and uh, offer sessions. So this is the first part of what you saw here is the first part of the consulting effort where we go and assess what the company needs. And then they say, okay, we need to be more innovative. That, we, that translates into two different dimensions. What are the processes and what are the, you know, company organizational stuff that we need to do to put that innovation into practice. Second, we talk about, you know, how can you develop more innovative mindsets, right? It's not just a question of processes and databases and number uh, the crunching of the ideas into a particular actionable thing, but also a mindset with which you come up with those ideas. 
So there we start building the mental muscle by providing you know, uh, facilities to think innovatively, posing challenges. Uh, so these, those they usually take the form of workshops. Okay, thank questions. you for your presentation. I, I find it's uh, very interesting. Thank you. And it is ideal that uh, uh, if a, a person or a company that have uh, those uh, five Agi agility. Mm -hmm. um, um, most time, some uh, a person or company probably good at uh, one aspect. Correct. Like I um, grow up, uh, like I got the uh, some idea, like um, develop. A, you, if you know which aspect is your strength, mm -hmm. and you need uh, like uh, um, to show your strength mm -hmm. and hide your weakness. Correct. So uh, I wonder if. Um, if for a company or for a person, what do you think that they emphasize at one aspect? Yeah. If they cannot achieve this five, sure. what the, will happen in your opinions on this? Yeah. So this, there's been a, I, I think you've all heard about the strengths movement where, you know, people talk about their strengths more than, you know, so you're really short like me. And I can never be a basketball player, right? Because I'm, I'm vertically challenged, right? So do I, do I go into the basketball game? So this is one kind of thing. So there are certain limitations which you cannot overcome, right? And so you're not going to be able to go into that area. But what happens is that the world that we're operating in, it's not just basketball and height. The world that we're operating in puts us in different kinds of circumstances. So you can't just rely on strengths. What if, for like for example, what happened with Nokia, not able to innovate, not able to respond to market needs, suddenly gets hit with iPhone, right? And then I don't know. I have great strengths in supply chain, but that not, that's not going to help me counter iPhone. In fact, I didn't even respond to Motorola's challenge to me when the world, the American market was crying out for a you know, a flip phone, they didn't even come out with a flip phone. They wouldn't move from that brick phone. Nokia wouldn't move from that brick phone, right? They were so wedded to that ideology. So that's my strength, but if I stick to my strength, I'm going to die, okay? So th this is the key thing that you need to understand, that there are strengths, but you shouldn't let your weaknesses become so big that, they, that you can be overpowered. So you try to build some kind of leeway into your weaknesses, that you can say, okay, now I can actually take some amount of thing, but I won't be killed. You know? And one of the key things that we advise is that if you can't develop it within your company, always hire external you know, organizations. So for instance, you're not very good at communication and crisis handling, maybe you should hire a PR company, right, to do that for you. So this is um, the various ways in which you can build uh, against those weaknesses. Yeah, in your presentation, or oh, just a comment you made, yeah. you mentioned Nokia multiple times, and also I think that there's another example is a BlackBerry. Absolutely. And so, how can the top two uh, smartphone company, Apple and Samsung, not to fall into their trap? What's the difference of okay. their past and the current? Very good. Okay. You know, one of the crises that uh, I've been seeing at Samsung is. Um, is a communications crisis. So for instance, with the batteries exploding, et cetera, it's of course a technical problem, but the way you would handle the perception of the market needs to be done much better. Okay, there there's, needs to be a much better handling of that. So um, it has been able to get through it, but in future, this is some, one of the things that Samsung will need to think about. You know, how do we build the public perception uh, of, of our things and uh, of, of our company? Same thing with the uh, iPhone. It's right now, you know, I mean, you, I, I, I think you all had the, uh, heard about the experience with the Apple Maps. So when they introduced the new iPhone, suddenly the Maps feature was not working very well and was uh, failing, but they managed to uh, overcome that. Apple has a different kind of advantage as compared to Samsung. Apple has something that you would call uh, a tribe culture, right? That people who want an Apple iPhone are wedded. So they're able to tolerate a lot more uh, problems 
that may appear in, that may come up in the technology as compared to you know other companies so when samsung works with uh, works against apple this is something that they should keep in mind but again as i said the five agilities they need to be thinking about these five agilities and not just uh, operate like the companies of the 1990s where you thought that resources we have our resources and we have our strengths and we will be able to leverage on them now you now need to be thinking about how can we be much more flexible in handling different kinds of world climates uh, different kinds of uh, markets and different kinds of competition that may come up so this is a key thing that they need to be do so and then innovation is always not just the key you know innovation is necessary but over focusing on innovation can also lead to a lot of problems so one needs to balance that Thank you. Any, any last questions? If not, then Robert, thanks a lot. Thank you very much.